do you ever reach a stage where you might actually have to compel people to go back? We're a very long way away from answering that question in that way. What we're saying is Hong Kong, the most crowded place in the world, can't deal with Vietnamese boat people who are not refugees any differently from the way in which every other country deals with people who are seeking unlawfully to emigrate to another country. Hi, uh, welcome everybody to Vibe Book and Music Shop. Um, this, today's event is, uh, is Les Bird, and uh, he's going to be talking about his new book, A Band of Small Men. Uh, a small band of men. Whatever. It's a <laughs> Need it over there. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we start again. Yeah, we, we'll speed up, guys. Okay, so we're here today to uh, talk about Les's new book, uh, The Trees of Hong Kong. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, for coming. Uh, very kind of you. Um, so this event is being recorded live, and we'll go out on Facebook. Uh, so your images will be on the internet. If, if you're not keen on that, then please move to the back of the shop. So otherwise, it's, it's, we're live now uh, to... to the internet, basically. <laughs> All right, so um, Vibe Book and Music Shop has been going for a couple of years. Um, we don't make, make much profit, but we uh, serve the community. Um, we have book events, we have local artists, we have um, um, musicians here, and events for the community. All right, so um, just a couple of concerns. All right, so this is probably the most people we've had in this shop uh, in one go. So. Um, just to let you know, the exits are here, <laughs> and only here. <laughs> right, so we have no back door, there's no escape route. You can only go out that way. Also, if you are concerned that you have the coronavirus, or you, you, you're thinking about getting it, then the bus station, <laughs> the bus station is over there, the 3M bus will take you straight to the Lantau, North Lantau Hospital, where somebody will meet you and process you. Okay, so can I ask those people to move towards the door now, please? <laughs> All right, okay, so let's get on with things. Um, so Les uh, has got a presentation which is carefully prepared. He'd like to um, basically present everything without question, uh, deviation or the other thing. Repetition. Uh, repetition. Yeah. So please keep your questions till afterwards. Um, so and then yeah, we can get down and dirty with it all. All right. So uh, from here, I welcome Les Bird. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could ask you to keep your questions till after, I. I very happy to answer any questions on this, uh, if you could look up here. Um, but I've only got an hour, and I've got over a hundred pictures to show you, so I'm going to be moving through them quite quickly. Um, uh, from the end of uh, 1975, all up to 2000, there were over 200,000 Vietnamese arrived in Hong Kong by boat. Um, and most of them arrived on what's called the southern boundary, which is south of Hong Kong. Um, in the 70s and the 80s, I was a, in the Marine Police and uh, a patrol boat commander, same as some of the guys here. Um, and it was our job to basically intercept them. I'm going to focus on two years, uh, 79 and 89, two milestone years, because these were very significant years in this era of influx of Vietnamese. Um, 79, uh, if, you, if you imagine 200,000 in 25 years, and about a third of them arrived in a 12-month period, that was an extremely busy year for, for Hong Kong and for us. And then I'm going to move on to 89. Um, that's when all the Vietnamese camps, there were 13 Vietnamese camps in Hong Kong, um, and they were all full. And the order came in 89, um, hold, them at the, hold them at the boundary, we can't take any more. We need some time to sort it out. And within 12 hours, we had over a thousand people um, on the southern boundary. Um, let's look, take a look at uh, 79. Um, why the big influx? Uh, there was a border war um, between China and Vietnam started in 78. As a result, there was pressure put on the ethnic groups in, in Vietnam. Um, and this caused many of them to want to leave. And 
people smuggling rackets began um, in order to help them leave and to make money, obviously. Um, there was a United Nations um, convention in Geneva in which um, the US, the UK, European nations attended and uh, the governor went along too. It was decided that Hong Kong would, would elect to be port of first asylum status. That means that, that we were going to receive all the, the refugees here. They were going to be processed by the United Nations and then third countries um, such as the States and Canada were going to accept them as, as refugees for resettlement. So it was a big move for Hong Kong to actually put, put their hands up there and say, we, we will do this. Um, just a quick overview of what it was like for uh, those on the boats. Initially in 79, um, the first refugees made it over to Thailand. That's 200 sea miles. Um, they went to Malaysia, Singapore, 300 sea miles. Uh, basically any direction where they thought they could land. Uh, the Philippines, Palawan was a, a big, there was a big camp there eventually. And then once for the first asylum status was granted to Hong Kong, um, they attempted the 1,000 sea mile journey. Um, a lot of them, I think, actually went along the coastal route, which made it a lot longer, but that journey would be maybe four, five, six weeks, depending on the state of boat that they, they were traveling in. In Hong Kong, um, the square, the black square, is the Hong Kong territorial boundary. Inside is uh, Hong Kong territorial waters, outside is international waters. We only had jurisdiction inside. And so our fleet was lined up along the southern boundary, um, mainly because the majority of the Vietnamese were coming from that direction. So our, our patrol launches were all lined up here. That's a typical um, Marine Police launch of the time, Police Launch 50. My own, my own was 56, identical. That's about... Um, it's, well, it's 78 feet long, it'll do 20 knots, and <coughs> the crew normally were about 12 people, but um, during that time we had to move people around a lot, and uh, uh, I had a crew of about six, six men on board. Um, and that photograph is taken escorting a, this is a Vietnamese boat. But this is the typical thing that we used to find coming in, in, in the 70s. Um, it's, you can see it's pretty dilapidated. It's actually a river boat which has a flat keel. Flat keel means that instead of having a V underneath the water, it's flat, which makes it very unstable. Um, and when it's full of people, you can imagine what with a two foot freeboard, that's the, the height above the water, um, coming a thousand miles um, across the open sea in that is pretty precarious. And w we never knew how many actually didn't make it but that was a typical type of boat that would turn up. These are three more shots. Um, that's a sailboat, um, moving quite quickly actually. That's south of Lantau. Um, again, full of people, maybe 30, 40 people on board. Um, and they'd be traveling like that for a month. A motorized one. Um, and I put those two shots up there because uh, our orders at that time were stop them, count how many they are, report it in, and then when we tell you, escort them into town. But if a boatload of people have been on uh, in these conditions for over a month, um, it, it also required um, medical assistance. They were malnourished, uh, dehydrated. So uh, the process started to get longer and longer and lo longer, depending on the condition of the people on board. We, we, we really became more welfare officers and police officers uh, over a time of about three or four months. Um, this cute little picture shows you um, the boats on the southern boundary. Um, I, the reason I put that up is because once we intercepted a boat here, we were required to take it here, which was the uh, Hong Kong government dockyard. And this was chosen by the Hong Kong government as the processing area where all the refugees would um, be uh, given medical treatment, the immigration department would be there to, to, to find out who they were. 
and that's a distance of about 25, 30 sea miles. So once you intercept a boat down here um, and, and give it initial assistance, then we had to escort it over there. We always escorted, never towed them. And so the speed that we went would be dependent on how good the boat was. So sometimes at five knots, it'd take about five hours. So some of these pe boats down here would, would be engaged in escorting duties. So it was actually a, an, an ongoing um, process that took uh, five or six hours, and that would be seven days a week, um, yeah, 24 hours a day. And so it went on for a year. Um, that is the government dockyard um, in 19, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the government dockyard. So there, that's, a, that's an orderly queue. There's about 50 or 60 boats there full of people. Um, each one is numbered. Under the, under the awning here is the immigration and the medical teams, and there's a queue of people, and each one um, uh, would would have a, a serial number and they would be waiting their turn. I put the number 9,000 uh, up there because on one particular day there were actually 9,000 Vietnamese in government dockyard waiting to waiting to um, find out what was going to happen to them. Once they'd been processed, uh, the, reason what, the reason why we used government dockyard was A, it was a big typhoon um, shelter, so it was sheltered waters. And at the back, there were boat sheds and warehouses that could be used to, to house these people once they'd been processed. That's one of the boat sheds. They were only actually in here for about two days, four day, uh, yeah, two days, about 48 hours before being moved onto a camp. So this was a temporary holding area. And those guys there would be probably getting a briefing on which camp they were going to. That was the situation right at the beginning of the year and it, although it was looked a bit manic and a bit disjointed it was actually sort of working but things came to a head um, when this started to happen. This is the Wei Fong, this is the first people smuggling racket um, organized out of Vietnam that came to Hong Kong. This ship um, the master of the ship sent a message to the Marine Department about two days before it arrived saying, I've rescued all these Vietnamese from, from the South China Sea in boats and I'm, I'm bringing them into Hong Kong. The Marine Department did a check, found out it had left Bangkok with one passenger. It had gone to Vung Tau, which is the port outside Ho Chi Minh, where it, it loaded up with these people who paid 10 tails of gold each to the Vietnamese authorities. And so it's basically a, a racket, um, a people smuggling racket. Um, we were told to go out and as police launch one here, this is uh, the command launch for that area. Uh, we were told to go out and stop it before it came in, which is what we did. Um, stopped it south of um, just east of the Po Toy group. Um, and government said, hold it there. And we want to think about what we're going to do with these people. Um, I left that pretty horrible photograph in because it just shows you the condition of the boat. That's the hull. Um, uh, it reflects what it was like inside and there were 2,700 people in there. That's a bit of a close-up shot. Police Launch 1 was told to hold station on it um, whilst government deliberated. They deliberated for a month um, it, they didn't want to set a precedent, but they also wanted to look after the people there. So it was it was a difficult. It put the government in a difficult position. Uh, the Hong Kong government came in for a lot of criticism for for keeping them out there for over a month. That's a shot I took from the stern of PL PL one. See the Wei Fong name there. That's a close up of that shot. There were a lot of kids on on that on that ship. Um, and then uh, after a month, government said, well, yeah, we've got to do something, we're going to take them off. So the, these next three photographs were taken on the day that uh, the refugees were taken off. They're all classified as refugees. It's a cold January. 
and that's the moment when um, that's the moment when they started to come off. You can see everybody craning their necks here, wait, trying to see what's happening. That's the first refugee coming down the steps. We put in a flat barge here. You can see the aid workers, um, Marine Police, Police Tactical Unit, and government people on the barge. Uh, you can see over on the far side a white um, Hong Kong Yamati ferry uh, triple decker. Um, they, the fleet of those came in to take these guys off and take them to a camp um, in Hong Kong. So that was the Hui Fong. Um, the, the master and his crew were all charged with various conspiracy um, offences. Um, the, the government really wanted to hit them hard because they taken them in, they still wanted to, do, to set a precedence here and, 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 uh, and charge this guy and he got f nine years, he got nine years for, for um, people smuggling and the crew together, the whole crew got 50 years altogether uh, and a subsequent search of the boat found 1.4 million US dollars worth of gold in the engine room which was their cut basically. So they lost out. The, yeah, so, so we hope that that court result would get back to Vietnam and make people think again. Unfortunately, it didn't work because two weeks later that arrived. <laughs> um, I think you probably know the, the name Skyluck. It's quite, it's quite well known in Hong Kong. The actual name of the ship was Kyalu, K-Y-L-U. They painted an S, a C and a K um, in order to try and fool the, the authorities. I don't know why they did that, but... Uh, the master learned from the mistake of the first guy. He didn't send a radio message. He decided he was going to come in in darkness uh, with no lights and try and land all 3,200 um, somewhere in Kowloon, I think, because he was, <laughs> he was actually, as he came in, he came in the same way and he made it as far as the inner harbour um, before the venerable PL1 stopped him. Uh, and uh, once we found out what that was, we were told to move him round to a sheltered bay in Hame One, west of Lama, uh, which is where it sat. So we had now the same situation, the Mexican standoff, what are we going to do with them? Uh, that's a shot of the Skylark in the bay. Um, that's PL1 on the far side. PL1 got the lucky job, you've done it once, you know how to do it, so this time you're going to do it again. Um, PL1 got the job of looking after um, the people on board whilst government deliberated what to do. This went on for a lot longer and you can see here what's happening. Um, this is a great shot actually. Uh, here is all the supplies uh, in covered sort of warehouses that have been put on a barge. Uh, that's PL1 over the far side, and Skylark actually had a, a cargo of plywood, plywood and cardboard. So while, whilst they were at anchor in Hame 1, the refugees bought everything out and started building huts on the deck, preferring to live outside rather than in the hold, which is pretty, pretty well, I'd probably, I'd probably do the same thing. Um, and you can see here the few close-up shots. You can see how relaxed it was becoming. The, the refugees are actually off the ship washing down the barge there. Um, and you can see their houses here. Uh, the Skylark was at anchor in Harmony One for five and a half months. <laughs> um, it, it, the government didn't want to make the same mistake again um, and, and, uh, and sort of encourage this sort of thing. You can see how relaxed it was. Um, the, there's a refugee sitting on the top of the steps. This is the way out. Uh, policemen are playing cards or something there. I'm not sure. Uh, but it, it all became really... Uh, it, it, the, the whole thing became um, a sort of a, a village, if you like. Um, and everyone knew everyone else. All, all the refugees knew the policemen. That's a photograph of uh, one of the refugees being taken off for medical treatment. That's, this is an interesting shot. His name Siu Hongbon. He's the master of the Skylark. And that's Paul Lai in uniform. Paul Lai was the Marine commander uh, on PL1 at the time. Um, 
they got on very well. They're both keen chess players, and that's what they did for five and a half months, basically, sit and play chess. Another interesting character, he was one of the Skylark passengers, a Vietnamese guy who spoke very, very good English. He became our official uh, interpreter. So he got a job on PL1, which he was very pleased about, because uh, he got him off the Skylark. Um, and there he is again, giving probably orders from that guy, Jeff Cox, he was the Marine commander. And anyway, five and a half months of this, and everyone was a bit fed up. And uh, anyway, it all came to a head one morning when the refugees cut the anchor chains themselves. On a, they waited for a blustery day when PL1 wasn't alongside, very, very smart. Cut the anchor chains and Skyluck went aground on uh, Sekok Choi, which is the northern part of Ha Mei Wan on, on Lantau. And about half the refugees jumped off the ship onto the hill. They didn't run away, they just wanted to get off. There's a shot of them on the hill. The, the people in the red uh, clothing at the top are um, police officers. Um, so most of them, they just sat there. And, and there were about 1,500 of them on the hill, um, and the others remained on the ship. Um, the older ones, those who couldn't get off, the children, they all remained on the ship, which caused a problem for us because the ship was capsizing towards the island, and we had to get everybody off. Um, and you can see there's a ladder down there, and PL, PL1 has actually attached some lines and is trying to keep the Skyluck from tilting over and fortunately we managed to get everyone off before it, it sank and it was eventually scrapped and all the refugees were uh, eventually accepted by Canada. It's a cute little story. Um, some of the refugees really did get on very well with their minders, the, the, the Marine Police. This family eventually went to live in Canada and the girl looking at the camera six years later she came back this poor lie uh, that's her um, and that's taken at Marine Police headquarters she was taking it she got in touch said she wanted to come back they took her out for for tea and she even got a trip on PL1 and they went back around to Lama to have a look where the Skylark actually went to ground we thought that that might be the end of it. There was a gap of a, a couple of months and no, no more arrivals by big ship, um, but unfortunately that didn't last. The, the last big ship coming in is called the Senon. The skipper on this one, um, really, uh, he, he took note of what had happened to the other two, and he stopped his ship here off Macau, and he left with his crew and his gold, and he disappeared into Macau. And he said to the refugees, that's Hong Kong. We're going to start the engine for you. Now go for it. And they did. And it came in on, uh, it came in just south of Lantau. And on passing a beach called Loke One, they decided that would be their target. And they, not knowing how to stop the ship, they just rammed it straight up the beach. That photograph was taken um, by a yachtsman who happened to be sailing past and there's there were 1400 uh, people on board and they just piled off and sat on the beach Saturday the 26th of May um, was my day off I was driving <laughs> a police jeep along South Lantau Road that afternoon um, and I was told on the radio something had happened in Loke One so I stopped the jeep climbed over the hill came down through this thicket so I'm actually on this photograph <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I don't really remember what, what, uh, um, where I was, but uh, I was actually on the beach asking everybody to stop. This, I'm a police officer, stay where you are. I know there's 1,400 of you, but just do as, do as I say. So they, they all sat down. They didn't want to run away. Um, and within 30 minutes, we had a flotilla of Marine Police launches um, coming in, and they were all taken off to government dockyard. And the following day, I went back and I took these three photos. Um, it was only 800 tons 
um, a lot smaller than the other two, but still had 1,400 people in its hold, which is in here. Terrible, terrible conditions in there. A couple died actually on the way over. So that was the last people smuggling ship to come into Hong Kong. That's a, a little graphic to show you the size of the Waifong, Skyluck and Senon in comparison with each other. We didn't stop a Boeing 47, that's there just for, just, <laughs> just for show. I can't claim that one. And the size of the Star Ferry in comparison to the Senon. After the, uh, those three ships, there were a lot more small boats coming in. One on the far right, if you can imagine a thousand miles, two guys on board. Um, these are, are actually rowing in. Um, this one completely under sail. Uh, some of these people were at sea for maybe two months. And a lot of them were overcrowded like this one. I think the one in the top is really overcrowded. From time to time, um, the boat basically was sinking or the, the engine had broken down. Um, it, it, and what we did then was we would have to tow it and we never towed them with people in. Um, so we had to take them on board and they would sit on board the police launch and we'd take them into government dockyard that way. That's my boat there, 556. Um, getting to the end of this first half, uh, this is a very familiar situation we would get into. We would stop one boat on the southern boundary, we'd be processing it, and then another one would arrive, and then another, and then another, and then another, and you'd end up basically surrounded by um, two or three hundred people, and you would then need help from another police launch to come and help you um, get them back into government dockyard. It, it, sometimes in, in, in 79, it was, uh, it, it was a bit of a crisis management situation. That was taken from the stern of PL56. We've got three boats there. And the last thing about 1979 that I remember really well, um, this is Thailand Police Base. Occasionally, we wouldn't be able to get to Government Dockyard because of the weather. Um, and so we would go to the nearest safe haven. Thailand is up near what's called the Gold Coast, now on the western side of uh, Western New Territories. On or in August of that year, um, this occurred. This is Typhoon Hope, which is, was a super, super typhoon, Signal 10, came straight across. Um, there it is, there's Hong Kong, and this is the South China Sea, which is where all these boats were coming from. Now, the day, in the days before Hope arrived, we were receiving a, between about four and 500 people. Um, and then for three weeks afterwards, we got none. There was no, no one. So I assume that Hope basically cleared the South China Sea of all the small boats coming across. Um, I'll give you an idea of what Hope did. Um, that's a Greek merchant ship that was a safe anchor inside the harbour. Um, it threw the ship against the um, Kowloon Star Ferry Concourse and smashed it. That's a ground. That ship is a ground. Now that happened in um, that happened in the inner harbour. So you can imagine if it did that to a, a ship in the inner harbour, what those small wooden craft out here would experience. And that basically is the end of that first year's photographs. That's just a typical. Um, type of boat that we, we would have and, and with that number of people. So looking across the actual, uh, the actual years, after, this is the end of the war in Vietnam. You can see that there was a bit of a trickle of, of um, arrivals under 10,000 a year. And then that was that spike. This was the, the war, the border war in China and the persecution in Vietnam. And uh, that, was, that, that happened. Um, the numbers went down significantly during the 80s because Hong Kong decided to, to introduce the closed camp um, policy. So, and they made that known in Vietnam. Um, 
anyone coming in would be put inside a closed camp. You were not automatically going to be um, sent to a third country for resettlement. So that actually cut it down quite a lot. But in 1988 and 89, the people smuggling rackets started again in Vietnam and the, um, the rumours started to go around that if you got to Hong Kong, you would be automatically given refugee status. And the people smuggling rackets basically pushed it up. Now, if you add those two figures together, um, you'll see why 89 was an important year. Because all the camps were full. We had 60,000 people in the camps here. There were 13 camps. And um, they were having problems in other, um, in other Southeast Asian countries too. The United Nations um, introduced what they call the CPA, uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, which meant that instead of everybody becoming refugees, you're now going to be interviewed. Some of you will be given refugee status. Some of you are going to be classified as illegal immigrants or economic migrants, as they were. Um, and a repatriation um, procedure with Vietnam was arranged with the UN so that anybody who was not a genuine refugee would actually go back to Vietnam. Um, it had to be done because uh, it was just getting out of hand again. Unfortunately, those in Hong Kong who were uh, segregated out and identified as uh, illegal immigrants didn't like that and the camps started to um, well there was rioting particularly in the Whitehead camp um, <clears throat> some of you remember that uh, and it became actually quite dangerous because we had North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese uh, mixed together um, and uh, the rioting got quite bad and it was at that time on the 2nd of June that we were told um, Okay, camps are full, there's rioting, we need some time. Hold all vessels out on the southern boundary. Um, and we said, for how long? They said, well, maybe 12 hours. Well, give us some time, we need to sort it out. That's an order. So that's taken on that day. Um, and within 12 hours, we had 16 of these boats uh, out south of L uh, Lantau and Lama. Yeah, and it started to get rough. So it was pretty, uh, it wasn't sustainable. And we were saying, well, well we can't keep them out. And, they, and the government was saying, well, we need time to sort ourselves out here. You can't bring them in. We said, what are we going to do with them? And they said, well, there's a sheltered bay in an island called Daya Chow uh, in the Soko Islands, which is, as you can see there, it's a deserted island. Um, uh, we want you to put them in the bay there and hold them. Don't let them go ashore because we're going to ask you to bring them into town possibly tomorrow. That's a, a map of, well, it's an aerial shot of Daya Chow. Uh, you can see how big the island is. That's a 400 meter ruler. So uh, it was about a 15, 20 minute walk from one end of the island to the other. Um, it's 1.4 square miles in size. And this is the bay. Um, they asked Marine Police to put it in, put them in. Uh, I arrived on day two, the following day, and took this photo from the hill. Uh, there's about 20 boats in there now. Um, so that was what I call day one, but it was actually the second day of this uh, exercise. <clears throat> and if I can just explain, there's a, another boat coming in, being escorted in. Um, and overnight, that green barge has been towed down. That was the barge that was used alongside the Skylark. And we're already starting to accept the fact that this isn't going our way and we're going to start to process them ourselves. So we started a processing system um, in the hope that uh, by tomorrow or the day after, we could take all these boats up to government dockyard and get rid of them. Um, that's a shot I took. Most of these shots uh, of this next 20 minutes uh, are my own photos. Um, that's a shot of the barge itself, close up. And this is the following day. You can see, don't let them go ashore order is starting to wear a bit thin. Um, there are a lot more boats now and there are only about 20 or 30 people um, that we have uh, to, to monitor all this. 
you can see some of them are already off. Some of them are already in the sea. This is a, a, a structure here on the island, so you can see how far they, they're drifting in. I mean, after being on one of those boats for six weeks, you can imagine that they actually wanted to get off, you know, and we're saying don't get off, but yeah, well, but uh, then they started to sink. I mean, I'm sure they sank them themselves, but uh, you can see here the wreckage and people sort of wandering around. So it, it was a difficult situation. We were still being told that maybe tomorrow you can bring them all in. Uh, so the, there's no power on the island. There's no water, fresh water. There's no food, obviously. Um, there's no sanitation. So we were saying, well, you know, you can't use this island. Uh, we, y we've got now 1,500 people. Something has to be done. Um, the people, uh, the boat people were dragging their boats up on the beach and actually living in them now. So the order to not let them land had just, just been forgotten, basically. I put that up there to show you what the building structure was like on the, the, there was a, a sea wall and a derelict house, that's it. And that became, uh, our police headquarters. You can see we've already, the first thing we've done is put the flag up, which is really important, of course. Um, uh, and you can see the, the boats are already been beached here. There's wreckage along the shore. There's another house at the back there. I think there are about five or six structures. Um, some of the guys here will remind me a bit later, I'm sure. So we started the processing actually in the house or just outside it on the sea wall. Um, so we moved off the barge, realizing that this wasn't going uh, anywhere any f fast. We, we, we were going to be here for a while. And I took these shots from the bay looking in. And that last one is taken from the pier looking back down. You can see the processing starting here. This is the inf infamous blue awning. Um, that became the office under there. There's a, a guy sitting in a chair taking notes there. And this is the next day. You can see we, we are now ashore and the Vietnamese are, some of them are still on their boat saying what's going on and we're saying what's going on and we're trying to make it work. There's the office. You see there's a government chair just to prove it. Uh, that's one of my boats over there, 20. Um, shallow draft. The, the draft at the, at the pier, um, th there was hardly any water here, so a big launch couldn't come in. So we had to ferry stuff in using our small boats. These are two of my guys here. These are Vietnamese uh, volunteers helping, and that's a food, uh, one of the first food um, arrivals. Food was biscuits, um, beans and rice. So we had the job of giving it out as well. Um, by the next day we were actually numbering, uh, numbering the beaches because that's where everybody was drifting off to. So there was Main Beach which is what we've been looking at just now with the house. Then there was a couple of more beaches which some of the Vietnamese preferred. That was Main Beach uh, on day five. It's getting, you know, there was now, end of the first week, there's 3,000 people <coughs> on the island, um, and there's still 20, 30 policemen looking after them with no supplies, with no power, with no uh, water, with no food, with no sanitation. Um, the, the Main Beach was preferred by a lot of the families for security reasons. They wanted to be close to the where the police post was. There were a lot of young single men arriving on Dai Chau at that time. Um, there'd been a demob exercise in Vietnam and a lot of the guys who were arriving were former soldiers of Viet the Viet North Vietnamese Army, uh, which caused a problem because a lot of these people were from South Vietnam and then we had the young guys from North Vietnam. And this is where they particularly like to go. Second and third, second, th second beach was the favorite for the North Vietnamese. So this guy is still in his army fatigues. There's no, no charade here. Uh, they've arrived. They've bivouacked quite expertly into the side of the hill. 
Um, they've used any rubbish they can find and made a hut, corrugated iron from the other side of the island. Um, they, they actually got themselves really well organized uh, very, very quickly. The problem was at night when there's no lights, they got them bored and wandering around looking for something to do. So these guys were actually a bit of a problem. That's the same beach looking the other way. You can see someone's built a house of cardboard. Uh, a lot of the people still lived on, on the, their own boats, even though they're ashore. That's uh, another shot of Second Beach. This guy's in uniform. I think they actually, uh, some of them were actually deserters. So they were quite desperate. They'd want to go back. And they were actually finding out through us that the repatriation scheme was now in place. And they were thinking, ah, right, okay, so I'm going to be sent back to, to Vietnam. I might as well make make the most of what I've got here. Um, that's Third Beach, if you remember, that's further down, um, not as well favoured by, by people as it was too far away from the police post and the security. And then there was a lot of waiting around. Uh, we're coming to the end of the first week now and there's still no news of what's going to happen to the island <clears throat> and what we're going to be doing with them. There's more and more help arriving uh, in terms of food, uh, trying to put in power, and so I'm thinking uh, this is, this is going to go on for a while. Uh, you can see people just sitting around waiting. There's a couple of shots uh, on the island. Uh, oh, guy who used to work for me. Um, um, the Vietnamese man or woman on the beach there. You can see that they've started to use the sails from the boats. Um, for cover for small, um, sort of small houses. A couple of close-ups. Security for his family, he's found, he's found some wire mesh and made a compound for himself and his family. South Vietnamese, concerned about what's, what happens at night. Uh, towards the end of the, uh, day five, yeah, towards the end of the first week, we got help <coughs> from the military in the shape of two of these landing craft, which are incredibly um, useful for moving equipment. And also they could get close into the beach. So they would bring in all the, all the food, all the equipment that was now becoming generators, uh, furniture for the, for the office, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sanitation stuff that could be moved and could be used in a, in a barren island, you can see. There, there's two, the two landing craft are doing their work there. And then uh, next day the army arrived with 50 tents, 50 ten-man tents. Uh, and we, get, we, we started putting them up. So it became a tent city, but the tents, a lot of them we, we were able to use to, to, as roofing. There was a lot of sort of this sort of affair on the island where a few walls with nothing in them. So we were using the tents as, to, as roofing. You can see the pier at the back, the processing still going on, still more coming in. Uh, they're, they're being counted. Uh, meanwhile, uh, sure, um, there's some kind of order being, you know, being arranged here. Uh, a lot of the younger Vietnamese who got, got older, the tents did, preferred to live on the top, on the hill, um, out of the way, um, where they had their own small communes. You can see the plastic buckets and basins here. Um, so, you know, stuff is coming in to try and help get the, get the order of the, of the island going. And these are examples of what kind of accommodation um, that they were they're actually building. This is, this became, this is the main beach um, where you, just next to the house, so this became sort of tent city uh, where all the families were living. Um, you can see the, the single guys over here have built their own hammocks. Um, there's a family living in the sort of half rock, half, uh, half tent. Um, yeah. So at the end of the first week, um, some kind of order is, 
uh, is coming up and you can see here there's a government officer there making some notes and there's an orderly queue. You'll know you notice in the next couple of shots the people at the front of the queue are all the young men who, who are you know the stronger ones they push their way through the through the through the um, through the families uh, and they're always first in line for whatever was going on uh, and it was towards the end I uh, just finish off with this picture here um, there was also ag aggravation uh, you can see that this is an argument um, probably between two ethnic groups uh, over something or other um, you can see that the young guys here are, are, are waiting for anticipation of something that's going to happen. So there was no segregation. It was impossible to police at night. Um, it was quite a very difficult situation in that first week. Uh, it was the end of the first week, luckily for me, that I, I was redeployed away from Diachau um, to do something else. So these are my, my actually my last photographs that I took myself. Um, on the island before I left after week one but I've got some more um, to show you what actually happened to the camp um, as it progressed so that probably was taken uh, yeah about two months later you can see there's a lot more organization go going on in, in on the on the main beach there um, the tents have taken over uh, on all the ramshackle structures have been removed um, there's no more boats uh, here's the house the office and there's a landing craft there um, something being brought in here they were still arriving of course but now it, it had become a, a, a temporary permanent sort of arrangement and that's taken um, probably a week or so later than that first shot because the sea wall is more uh, more finished um, the reason that was built is for a safe haven for if there was a typhoon we could put boats in there and they wouldn't get wrecked. You can see there's still some boats on the, on the, on, on the, on the, on the beach there. And this is the house here. So it's looking back the other way into Tent City. Um, then there was a cholera outbreak uh, <laughs> just to top it all off. And we had to evacuate everybody off the island. Um, and we thought at the time that would be it. Everybody's off for medical treatment in town. And that would probably be the end of Diachau. But whilst everybody was off, government had other ideas. And so they built these four Nissen huts. And after the cholera outbreak was sorted out, this is August, yeah, um, they were all put back in again. So instead of living in tents, they then lived here. Um, and eventually the government said, well, um, we, now, we, need, we need this facility and we're going to designate it as the 14th um, permanent Vietnamese camp for Hong Kong. They took those Nissen huts down and built that. That's now two years after we f week one. Um, that was built. Um, it housed a total of 10,000. It was built to house 10,000. I don't think it ever did uh, have 10,000 Vietnamese in there. But it became the permanent camp. So if you can imagine day one, what we were, how we started, um, uh, two years later, it's, it's, it's changed into this. And that's just shot from the hill, looking back into the bay. Uh, and you can see the purpose-built pier there deep water pier, there's a road and there's more huts alongside the seawall. The seawall has been built in so there's no more beach. It's a big job. A couple of shots inside. And the 1996 was the day that uh, was the time when this was actually closed down. <coughs> Uh, just before the handover, um, government decided to close the camp. Under all the refugees inside, or those people who were inside, um, there were 5,500 of them um, on that particular day. And it took about a week to move them out, and they were put in other camps. 
Hmm. Let's see if this works. Yeah. So after they were moved out, uh, it was knocked down. And that photograph, those two photographs were taken about, I think, about five years ago. You can still see where the, where the, 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 the outline of the camp. So that, was, that is more or less the way it is today. This is the main beach, seawall. This is where Tent City was. And this square here was where the house was. So you look back at it as it was uh, that first week, more or less the same angle of the photo. You see the house there, and that was the beach. And that was the end of that particular exciting week that lasted seven years. Mm. And that's basically a summary of what happened for those 20 years. Uh, there were 211,000 Vietnamese arrived in Hong Kong, 143 resettled, and 67 went back to Vietnam. 67,000 went back to Vietnam. Uh, thank you. That's it. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, Paul, Les. <laughs> <laughs> band, of, band of small men. Band of small men by Paul. What is his name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Les. Uh, excellent talk. And um, Les's book, A I Small Band of Men, is available here at uh, $180. Les will dedicate it to you if you're interested. Um, there is a small number here. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.